Welcome everybody to the Amgen Ventures and Business Development in Los Angeles panel. I am pleased to introduce Rajat Malhotra, Executive Chair of Dive Biopharmaceuticals and also UCLA Technology Development Corporation Board of Directors member who will be the moderator of this exciting panel with our major stakeholder and of course sponsor of LA Best. So Rajat, I welcome you and please um, look forward to your panel. Thank you, Mark. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks uh, to my panel. Uh, no, no LA Biotech event would be complete without uh, either an Amgen presence or a discussion around uh, business development. So thank you to Mark and his team. We've assembled um, quite an illustrious group uh, here from, uh, from Amgen across uh, their business development ventures, genetics, and uh, digital health Group. So let me let me do the quick round of introductions, um, and then we'll get into a bit of a discussion around BD. And I, for all of our participants, thank you for joining. I promise I will save some time towards the end for uh, for Q and A. Uh, you do have um, you do have the ability to lob questions, and I uh, I will try my best to to get those uh, to to our panelists here. Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, let me um, let me just go around the horn. Um, uh, we have um, in no particular order. We've got uh, Jessica Droge. Um, Thanks, Jessica. It's nice to see you again. Uh, she is uh, the VP of Business Development at Amgen. She leads uh, Search and Eval and Business Intelligence. And what I had not realized is that her group sees over 2,500 opportunities every year. In in incredible. Um, Rachna uh, Kosla, it's nice to see you as well, Rachna. As also um, a colleague and uh, VP of BD, she leads the transactions team and is responsible for corporate development and strategic collaborations, M&A, licensing, as well as international um, BD. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Janice um, Nave. Um, Janice, thank you. Uh, thank you also for joining. Uh, Janice is the managing director for Amgen Ventures, uh, serves on a number of boards, and I um, uh, was also excited to see that she was selected to sa the San Francisco Business uh, Times uh, Most Influential Women in Bay Area business in uh, 2020. So congratulations. Um, Casey uh, Caparelli, um, Casey, nice to see you, uh, is the executive director, uh, genetics strategy and business development at Amgen. He works closely with the uh, with Decode Genetics and Amgen's subsidiary uh, and drives um, helps drive Amgen's overall genetics uh, strategy. Um, and then of course, last uh, but not least, we have uh, Carlin uh, Chrysostomo, um, who is, uh, the executive director of Amgen's Digital Health and Innovation Group, uh, and spearheads in that role Amgen's activities um, in emerging digital and advanced analytics uh, solutions. So, thank you all. Um, uh, it's quite a quite a quite a group we've got assembled here. But let me. I, I have a few questions of my own, so we'll we'll maybe get started um, uh, with, with perhaps a a, a pretty broad one. Um, directed at uh, Jessica and, and, and Rashna, uh, but I'd just love to understand, how does Amgen view the role of business development? Great, um, Jessica, maybe I'll start. And obviously your team is very influential in, in what we look for. Um, it, it, I would say it's critical. And um, you know we look at a number of opportunities every year, as you've mentioned. I think what may not be a well-known fact is currently, 50% of our revenues is from external sources. So we have been active in BD throughout the years and throughout our history. This isn't something that is new for Amgen. And much of our pipeline is also generated through external innovation. I think what's interesting is when I first started doing deals in the biotech pharma sector, which is almost three decades ago, there was a bias in big companies that uh, if called the not invented here syndrome. If it didn't come from your own, um, own labs, it couldn't be worth anything. And that has really changed. Um, and you've seen that really change even in the most recent past where innovation is happening just everywhere. Um, and everywhere, I mean, literally across the globe. And so we have to be open-minded to find um, the best innovation to be able to ultimately meet our strategic objectives and serve patients. So it's very important for us and we remain engaged uh, with the broader ecosystem to find the best opportunities to complement what we are doing internally. Jessica? No, I couldn't have said it better. I, I think that that's true. And I, I, I wanna reiterate what Rechna said regarding our portfolio. We are highly dependent on the external landscape, both for collaborations, licenses, and acquisitions. So 
we are, don't work alone. We we need the the innovation that's coming all across the globe to you know be able to create and generate new drugs. So highly important to us. Could you could you tell us a little bit about uh, recent um, activities, deals, and, um, and 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 looking forward? What are what are the what are the TAs and areas of innovation that are of um, highest interest uh, to you? Well, I'll let Jessica talk about the TAs and maybe the areas that are of highest interest to us. Um, but I'll just say that uh, in the last couple of years, we've done a number of deals, and you may have heard of all of them. I will, before I name a couple of them, let me just say is that we are deal size agnostic. I mean, what we're really trying to do is find the right opportunity for Amgen. And if partnering is the way to go or an acquisition is the way to go, we really want to be able to work with our counterparty and find what is the best deal structure to have it be a win-win for both parties. And we are also open to size of deal. So for example, we did an acquisition a couple of years ago of a company called New Evolution, which was about a $170 million deal early technology platform deal for us. In that same year, we also acquired Otesla, which was a $13.4 billion deal, marketed product for psoriasis. So that really shows you just the, the range with which we are willing to operate in terms of deal size. And then most recently, we acquired a company called Five Prime Therapeutics, um, they had a phase three ready program for gastric cancer. We're really excited about that program. And we also acquired an early research uh, company called Rodeo Therapeutics to help us round out some of the activities um, that we're doing internally in inflammation. So if I, you want, I can just touch on a little bit on in the areas of innovation that we're interested in, and I'll categorize them in two ways. One, therapeutics. And then one, the platforms and technologies that help us actually, at the end of the day, design and build those therapeutics. So I'll start with the technologies. We're, we, are, we have a huge, as opposed to some, but not all, you know, large pharma, we actually depend a lot on our internal discovery research efforts and have a huge amount of internal expertise. But we, and we also use you know, over 10 different modalities to build therapeutics. And we try to identify the best way to build a therapeutic based on what the disease is and also the patient population and how the patients may respond to that you know, in terms of the way that the drug is administered or the actual side effects that the drug may have. So in terms of the technologies and platforms, like Rechna mentioned, you know, we, we acquired new evolution that expanded our small molecule capabilities in a huge way. They have a DNA encoded library and it allows us to scan billions of potential therapeutics and to identify small molecules that may be able to target what, you know, has been quite impossible to target up until now. So that's, that's a huge advancement. Um, I'm going to let Casey a, a little bit later speak about the genetics, but we leverage a lot our decode genetics capabilities to validate um, and also learn more about the, the, the actual target that we're trying to uh, interdict in terms of which drug would be best and which target would be best. For the platforms currently, we're looking at platforms that allow you know, better therapeutic index to generate drugs uh, build better multi-specifics, multi uh, drugs that allow tissue specific tissue targeting for RNA modulators. So just a whole plethora of different innovative platforms that allow us to advance drug development further. On the therapeutic side, we're mostly our core areas are cardiovascular, metabolic, oncology, and inflammation. So in oncology, across the board interested in solid and heme, IO, non-IO, et cetera. It just has to be overall a meaningfully important benefit to the patients. It can't just be a small incremental benefit to the patients. Um, for cardiometabolic, uh, we have a huge amount of effort invested in our internal capabilities, but we're always looking for opportunities to find new therapeutics for heart failure and other cardiometabolic disorders. Obviously we have Repatha that's on the market. Um, so we're actually looking for uh, alternatives to LDL to interdict for atherosclerosis. And we currently have an internal trial that we partnered with Arrowhead that's an siRNA that's targeting LP little a. 
Uh, and then for inflammation, we're looking at um, all across the board, all different types of disorders, autoimmune, that includes um, respiratory, it includes, you know, IBD, uh, lupus, et cetera. So, and the nice thing I think in inflammation is that generally when you get one mechanism, it can be used across a broad number of different indications. So I'll stop there because I know I mentioned a lot and I'll, I'll give some time back, but I'm happy to answer questions later too. Thank you, Jessica. One follow-up question. As you, as you think about the, um, the, the volume of uh, um, opportunities you're seeing, uh, once you get past the therapeutic area and technology screen, what are some of the other considerations uh, that come into play when you're assessing uh, each of these opportunities? Yeah. And, you know, when we look at opportunities and if we decline or pass on an opportunity, it doesn't mean that in any way it may, means that that drug is never going to make it to market or be successful, et cetera. There are a lot of things that we consider when looking at an opportunity. So one is the scientific rationale, of course, you know, so what does it make sense? Is it feasible to develop? Is there an actual unmet need in the patient population? And is the way that that drug is trying to meet that need going to be um, acceptable to the patients that need to take that drug? You know, obviously in oncology, there's a lot more tolerability with risk as opposed to potentially in the cardiovascular population. So um, we assess that. We assess the, you know, what is the land, what's the landscape going to look like when that drug potentially launches? What's the competitive space? What's the payer space going to look like in that market? And what's also the market protection that this potential therapeutic may have? So does it, what, what's the IP life? Or are you going on you know, biologic exclusivity, regulatory exclusivity, et cetera? So, um, and, and then at the end of the day also, we have internal prioritization. So we need to make sure that, hey, are we, are we able to resource this program adequately? And would we bring value to the program? You know, sometimes there's an opportunity that's a great opportunity, but if we can't truly bring overall value to that program, it may not be the best for us in our hands. But if, if we have the expertise, we have the manufacturing, et cetera, we can bring a lot of value and expedite um, that program getting to patients. And I would just add actually, is that even if we've declined an opportunity once, twice, maybe several times, that may not mean that we may not come to you later um, and partner with you because as we know, you know, data evolves. I mean, we, we don't live in a static um, industry and I like that, right? Everything is dynamic. And so as the data evolves and the story emerges, um, you know, you may find yourself partnering with Amgen and actually there are several acquisitions that we've done over the course of our history, Onyx being one, even Five Prime, where we had looked at those um, programs and it just wasn't the right time for Amgen uh, to make the bet, if you will. And so I wouldn't be discouraged um, if you hear no from us um, as you continue to grow and evolve, please continue to you know, keep the relationship uh, alive with Amgen. That, that, thank you, uh, Rashna, for, uh, for uh, uh, reiterating that and uh, Jessica for, for saying in the first instance. Uh, for, for those of you in the audience, Amgen does have a booth and you know where to find each of the panelists here. So, um, so, so do, um, do take them up on, uh, on that offer. Uh, let, me, let me change, um, let me shift gears a little bit uh, and move to you, Casey, and talk a little, you know, uh, Jessica mentioned genetics. You know, let, me, let me just start with the, the big broad question. Why is Amgen focused on human genetics? And I think the, the reason for Amgen's focus on human genetics dates back to the 2012 timeframe when we acquired our subsidiary in Iceland that was mentioned previously, Decode, Decode Genetics. But at the time, and I think it still holds true today, you know, the industry is spending more and more to develop a therapeutic success rates aren't where they necessarily should be. And, and I think we have this hypothesis and we're continuing to pursue it that studying disease in humans is much more effective than studying disease models elsewhere in other biologic systems, um, animals, um, in, for example. And, and so we've, we acquired Decode Genetics to really help us understand disease in humans, and, and not only disease um, through genetic perturbations, but it's becoming more and more focused on human data in general, where we're starting to roll in proteomic data and metabolomic data and transcriptomic data to really paint the whole picture of a biologic target system pathway in humans to help us better understand 
the biology and therefore help us to, you know, deploy our resources from a discovery through development perspective against those targets. The idea is if you understand disease in humans, you will have a higher success rate um, and have the ability to, you know, to commercialize, ultimately commercialize and bring therapies to patients in a very, um, very focused, very focused manner by, you know, fundamentally understanding their disease better than we could in the past. Thanks, Casey. And, and, and what could you could you tell us a little bit about the uh, genetics opportunities that Amgen is currently interested in? Yeah, I think they fall into a few different a few different buckets. You know, Jessica alluded to the fact that one of the criteria we use when we're evaluating deals is how can Amgen add value? So I think on the on the in license or acquisition side, you know, can we gain insights into a target that Jessica and her team are looking at? through our work at Decode and, and provide us an opportunity to perhaps add value in a way that others, others can't. And that's where there's a lot of synergy between our business development efforts that Rachna and Jessica lead and the work that we do at Decode. But additionally, you know, if you just step back from where is the world, where is the field in the context of the exploration of human genetics and, and human data, there's, there's a large emphasis worldwide on generating more data, more diverse data, um, in different ethnicities, different disease areas. A lot of the early genetic work has been done in individuals of European descent. And, and so one of our areas of focus is generating and gaining access to new data, new data sets. And, and you know, examples of that include our collaboration with Intermountain Healthcare, where we're working with them to sequence over half a million individuals, and then they take the information and, and, and return that information back into their patient population um, so that there's clinical applicability right out of the gate. We also have a, a collaboration that we're a part of with three other pharma companies on the UK Biobank to conduct whole genome sequencing of the entire half a million individuals in the UK Biobank. So I think you can see from these examples, we're interested in opportunities to gain access to broad populations and, and, and you know, to increase the amount of data that we have access to because it provides you greater statistical power and the power, and the power to discover rare variants that ultimately provide you those insights into biology that we're, that we're looking for. Um, so I think that's probably the primary area of, area of focus for our, for our genetics related BD activities, gaining access to additional data sets, both in a broad sense, as well as in specific disease areas that we have of, that are of interest to the company. Thanks, Casey. And as, as you think about you know, business development in this area, what are, what are some of the challenges and what are, where are the opportunities? Uh, yeah, Rajit, it's, a, it's a really good question. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a new frontier, you know, as we, as we start to work with, with companies or, or with consortiums to put together, you know, deals related to genetics, the, the intellectual property considerations, the, the data custodianship and who has access to the data and what you can do with those data and the, and the implications for the patients or the participants in the research of returning results to those individuals or making the results public all lead to, you know, very, um, I think in many cases, very bespoke deals, but also, you know, terms of deals and, and issues that have that come up in these deals that really haven't been necessarily, you know, well-trodden in the past. And so I, I like that part because you have to be very creative in the deal-making process, but it's also challenging when you're starting to think about a, a, a relationship where there is value to be had on both sides of the, of, of the equation and how do you actually come to you know, that value proposition in a way that, you know, maybe has never been done before. Thank you, Casey. Um, let me, uh, let me switch uh, tracks a little bit once again and, and uh, turn to you, uh, Janice, uh, as, as we think about um, Amgen Ventures. Um, we'd love to, you know, we'd love to understand what, what is, uh, what does Amgen Ventures prioritize uh, when you're looking at potential, uh, potential investments? What, what are you looking for? You know, it, that's a, it's kind of a hard one to answer simply. I think that uh, you can, you heard from my colleagues that there's a real focus on our pipeline, what we know now, uh, what we want to develop now. And I think for Amgen Ventures, you know, I'm really proud of Amgen because even setting up a corporate venture fund and allowing us the, the ability to invest kind of across the board, it really shows that we're taking a long-term approach as opposed to just short-term profits. So that's really what the venture fund does. And as such, when you look at the, the, the industry and the business 
as we see it now in healthcare, particularly in the US, I mean, we got a you know, $4 trillion industry and kind of questionable really healthcare benefits, particularly for you know, certain parts of our population. So Amgen's really taking a real uh, concerted approach at looking at that. So that's really starting at the 10,000 foot view. And so the way we look at it from a venture standpoint is, you know, our, certainly our bread and butter, you know, our roots are working with discovery research. Are there new targets? Are there new pathways to invest in? Are there emerging platform technologies, siRNA, mRNA, cell therapies, uh, gene therapies, certainly those as well. But we're also taking on the fact that, you know, Amgen already has some great marketed drugs. Are there things that we should do to try and get those to patients in a more efficient manner, uh, a better manner, more adherence? And my my colleague, uh, Carlin, will talk a lot about that. So, you know, how do we get these to the patients? Um, How do we get these to the right patients even? So we've done a lot of work with our Center for Observational Research. So we deal a lot in real world data real world evidence along the data lines like Casey was alluding to. But then also we've got some great pipeline products too that either we've developed de novo through our discovery research or we brought in through our business development teams. Um, you know, how do, how do we better process those through our clinical trial engagement? How do we enroll faster? How do we reach different diversities and populations for enrollment? You know, wh- wh- what are the technologies that align there? And again, you know, that's brought me kind of in close proximity to my my colleague, Carlin, who runs the digital health and innovation effort. Um, And then also, again, moving even earlier. And I think we're looking at different stacks in the omics space uh, or companies that do uh, the analytics, uh, AI, machine learning. So, you know, when we look at what we're prioritizing, um, I'd have to say that what we want to do is is really focus on an area or a company that is going to make a a more dramatic difference and address a real problem as opposed to we've got a technology, what can we do with it, but really go to those areas that there's really big challenges. Uh, And then we also, you know, look beyond kind of the technology and the asset and we look at the ability to execute. And that takes us really looking at the team, the co-investors and such like that. And that's part of the prioritization as well. Uh, But I would have to say, you know, compared to when we started the fund, you know, 16 years ago when I joined and it was just very linear. Uh, now, man, we are just like across the map, very iterative. Uh, and uh, that's, I think, probably some of our most, I think, some of our most really um, interesting recent in- investments that we've made and, you know, largely with the help of Carlin and her team. Th- thank you, Janice, John, for that for that overview. How does, there's um, as, as a question from the audience and I, I wanted to combine it with one one of my own which is um, h- how does Amgen Ventures work within the broader Amgen organization? And, and perhaps a related question is, you know, for someone seeking funding, um, what are the differences between, you know, corporate VC versus traditional, you know, standalone VC? How, how should they be thinking about that? Okay, a Co- couple of different questions there. So let's take, tackle the last one first. Um, the, the traditional or ROI return on investment type of investors, institutional investors compared to a corporate. I mean, they kind of cut across the board. You'll find corporate VCs that are within their organizations that are extremely well aligned with what's going on in the organization and those that can really kind of play on the edges. Um, I think, you know, the studies have shown that the investments or the companies that actually have at least one or more corporate VCs tend to actually have uh, better values, you know, valuations, exits, things like that. I think that there's enough data out there that shows that, you know, just hint to everyone, it's it's really worthwhile to get a corporate VC engaged. Uh, we like to do it because we work really, we're b- very embedded in our organization. In fact, these are my work colleagues, you know, in BD. So there's just a, honestly, if you reach out to any of us, you'll get to the right place pretty darn quickly. Um, but more importantly, we're, we're actually a small venture team. So we rely a lot on our scientists, folks in commercial and digital to help with diligence, to find investments. And uh, probably where the rubber meets the road is after we make the investments is really the engagement from our Amgen um, colleagues to really help make that company successful. In fact, um, 
We just recently announced a close on an investment on a company in which we put our VP of Discovery Therapeutics on our board. So, you know, I think, think about it that way that the ROI types of investors are fantastic, deep pockets, great governance, um, excellent Rolodex, things like that. A corporate VC can get you pretty darn close to um, who could be the inquirer or end user of your technologies. Great, no, great. Um, uh, th- thank you. Uh, very, very, very clear. Um, what are uh, what are some of the areas that are exciting to you right now? You know, anywhere where tech meets biotech to me, because um, I think that that's where the that's when you see the intersection of spaces. That's where you see the real leaps in discoveries. Uh, and one area that we're really interested in is in cell ther- cell therapies from an investment standpoint. Uh, obviously, we've seen that we've d- dramatic um, increases in survival rates using uh, CAR T types of therapies. Um, but what's really cool about it is that's like first generation, and now we're starting to see the second generation synthetic um, circuitry, um, different targeting capabilities, different cell types, T cells versus NK cells. I mean, you can just see that you know once you get traction in that space, it almost starts whole new whole new threads and in industries. So that's one area that's super exciting. And then also the space, you know, that, you know, Casey and his team are working on anything that's acquisition of human data um, is, is giving us such huge insights, especially as we're able to more quickly access the data, analyze the data and gain those insights. Uh, we're really going to be making some leaps, I think, in terms of, you um, how to more efficiently bring the right medicine to the right patient at the right time, uh, and potentially even find new therapeutic you know, targets and pathways to go after. So those are, you know, I like to play in, I like to play in that space. Thank you, uh, Janice. There's actually a question from the audience around um, your level of, you mentioned cell therapies, and there was a question asking if there's an interest in cell therapies for neurodegenerative diseases uh, specifically. So we have cell replacement or, Neuroprotective mechanisms, and I, I don't know if this is uh, too too detailed for uh, for for a for a panel mm-hmm. discussion, but maybe any any thoughts you might have. Um, well, up let, in my mind. let me answer it two ways. One is, yeah, personally, I think that that's a great area for regenerative medicine. In fact, we made an investment in the past, an area for Parkinson's. Um, so definitely, we'll continue to look at that space because it's our job to as there's you know, new areas to pursue in new ways to bring it to the organization. I'd have to say it's probably going to be a little bit of a, you know, a, a, a heavy lift to get an investment made just because Amgen, you know, has at this point in time kind of, you know, divested ourselves of kind of our neuro capabilities and our scientists it makes it a little bit harder to uh, do, do the necessary diligence in those spaces. Terrific. Well, thank you, uh, Janice. Well, let me, uh, Carlin, maybe let me, let me turn to you uh, for a moment. I'm curious to see, as you, as you said it um, uh, in, in the digital health world, how has COVID um, impacted, you know, what, uh, uh, what you do and your level of interest in, the, in this area? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I don't think this is news to anyone, right? But COVID has really uh, made the adoption of digital technology more critical than ever. I mean, one clear example of that in our industry, and I think um, Jan has alluded to this a little bit, is in clinical trials. You know, during COVID, we had to ask ourselves, how do we continue running our studies when patients are unable to go to the brick and mortar clinic? So I think this has really, you know, forced us to evaluate how to best adopt technology solutions, whether it's telemedicine platforms, whether it's you know, remote monitoring solutions or sensors um, that would enable patients to continue participating in studies at the comfort of their home. And I think even with these technologies, we can also improve how we um, bring care to populations that have been hard to reach via traditional healthcare delivery as well, like vulnerable populations. So I think going back to your question and how it's impacted Amgen, I think I think it's been a catalyst, really. It's been a catalyst for many companies and, and, and industries. Um, I think at Amgen in particular, it's really enabled us to get more critical sponsorships and, and, and support from our leaders. Um, and I think overall, it's just we're just more purposeful around how we pursue and adopt um, opportunities in the, in the technology space. It's exciting, and there's a lot more to do. 
And, and Carl, so you, you know, as you talk about spon- sponsorship and just raising the, the the relevance of the area, how does maybe tell us a little bit about how your group works within Amgen and applying, you know, digital health and technology solutions within the within the within the firm. So, so we're a corporate function, which basically means that we sit. We don't sit within the core business units like R and D or commercial, for example. So we have really the opportunity and, and, and the luxury to get an, an, an enterprise view of the key business problems across the organization, which is great. Um, and I think because of that, we're able to really evaluate different ways we can apply technology across the value chain, so to speak. Um, so our team comprises of um, our data science and engineering team, which is focused on AI and machine learning. Um, our business development team um, focused on external prospecting and diligence of these technology companies. And then our product leads who essentially interface with the various business units across the organization. So we we typically operate in two ways. The first is we partner and execute on on projects that's specific to the business question. So, you know, a, a brand lead can come to us and say, how do we how do we improve medication adherence for therapy X using technology? Or, you know, how do we optimize our clinical trial site selection using our existing data and machine learning techniques? So, so the first way of interacting with the business is really rooted in a you know, like a defined business problem. And then the other way is more of a push where we're providing the business with more tech competitive intelligence and recommendations in areas where they may not even be considering. So I think this you know, push and pull dynamic has really helped the teams expand their thinking around what's possible, which is great. And Carlin, how do you, um, how do you partner with external companies as, as you're pushing this agenda? It's, so you know, part of our remit within digital health is piloting technology and de-risking, um, you know, projects um, with our business partners. And, I, and because of that, we partner with really a wide spectrum of companies. I mean, we work with very early stage startups all the way to more established technology companies. And we have, you know, various channels and identifying partners. Uh, the first is we have a number of um, partnerships with accelerators and incubators across the world who help us source um, and identify um, digital solutions that fit our, fit our need. And then, you know, I work with these guys. I work with uh, Janice closely, as she mentioned, um, work with her um, and her portfolio companies in the digital space to internalize and adopt their offerings within the organization, which I think is very important. And then, of course, we do our, you know, traditional external outreach and prospecting as well. So I encourage anyone who's interested in you know, partnership in this space to um, reach out to me. I think the LA tech ecosystem is, you know, stronger than ever. So hopefully I get to speak with some of you soon. Thank you, Carlin. Well, let me, um, you know, uh, keeping an eye on the clock here, we've got about a little over 10 minutes left. Let me open it up to the audience for a QA. and uh, a A couple of you have loved questions, but if, if there are others, feel free to uh, submit them and I'll um, try, and, um, uh, try and have the, the panel respond. Uh, and while we're waiting for uh, um, uh, for that to come through, I guess the as I step back, and the question for all of you is, for all of the researchers and the entrepreneurs in the audience, right? What what advice do you have as as you know sitting on sitting on the corporate uh, side? What advice do you have as they're building their businesses and looking for ways to collaborate uh, and partner with a company like Amgen? I'll start. I'm sure all of us have thoughts, but. Um... The advice I think, and you know, Rachna touched on this earlier is, you know, this this is a relationship over a long amount of time. Uh, don't don't think that your first interaction with a large pharma uh, for a potential partnering deal is going to end, um, you know, in six months with a deal. So it's generally, you know, you really want to get to know the people that you're talking to on the large farm side. And, and likewise, you know, I'm, I'm speaking on our side too. We wanna to get to know the people at the company, build a trust, understand the credibility of the founders, the SAB, et cetera, understand the science. You know, honestly, if you're, if you're really developing something innovative, we may, you're the experts and we may not be, right? And so it takes us time to digest it, understand it, and then get comfortable with the data that's going to be continually be generated. So we may want to revisit, you know, every whatever data milestones are coming out. And it may take a few years, right, until we're ready 
to engage in a in a full onboard, you know, diligence and and start negotiating the deal. So don't get frustrated with that. Um, and then in the meantime, communicate clearly. Really articulate, you know, how does the how does the you know product work? What's the actual unmet need there, and how do you see it differentiated, et cetera? You're you're educating us. And I would add to that, um, and what I might say here, it may seem at odds um, with each other, but they're not. I think the first is to piggyback off of what, you know, Jessica said, which is when you're coming to Amgen or other partners, you know, have that vision in your mind of how do you think your product platform, um, whatever it is that you're you're creating will fit in with, with an Amgen. What, what is the vision and how do you see the strategic fit on that? So coming back to Jessica's point on education, and then given that this is a relationship and the data is evolving, um, don't be uh, hesitant to just not have all of the answers because the data is evolving, because that ultimately brings trust in the relationship. So when you talk to companies, I think sometimes um, I've seen companies make the mistake of appearing that they have everything all buttoned up when they really don't. And that is not um, a dynamic that um, it is intentional in any way, but just keep in mind that you, that as a company, you are learning about your own product as it's evolving. And so you have the, um, the, you know, just the humility maybe, or just even just say, I don't know, right? I don't know what I don't know. And we'll come back to you. And in that exchange of not knowing what you don't know, you may actually even learn something from, from Amgen that might help you. Um, change how you're thinking about running a clinical trial or how you're thinking advancing a molecule further. And, and I just want to say also, if, if we decline, and we may decline five times, there may be many other reasons that have nothing to do with your actual asset for the reasons that we're prioritizing internally or, or making different decisions internally. So. I think, Rajit, the other one point to emphasize is how can Amgen help you? How can Amgen add value to the technology or the target or the capability that you're, that you're developing? Help us to think through that piece because, as Jessica said, you're the experts, and, and we may not be the ones to fully appreciate where we can be adding the most, the most value. So I think that's also another important point to emphasize as part of the dialogue. Thank you, Casey. Um, you know, what about um, how important is it, Carla, as I think about your area, for instance, but I'm sure it's relevant to, um, you know, Jessica, you talked about technologies and, and, and platforms. Um, how important is it for entrepreneurs to have a sense of the um, Amgen portfolio, the Amgen context and customizing their, you know, their pitch? Right, uh, to you, whether it's health technology or it's a an, an, an enabling technology. Right? I think that's important. Oh, go ahead, Jess. No, go ahead. No, yeah, no, I, I think it's important. I mean, there's there's such a wide array of technologies that are being used outside of biopharma, right? That you know, many of these companies are sort of exploring and or entering in the biopharma space without really knowing much about the industry. So I I do think you know. Do your homework a little bit is is my my recommendation. I think I think at this stage um, within our digital health group, we're also we're also open to co development, right? And 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 broader partnerships that are not necessarily just you know a uh, one off point solution for a specific brand. I think we're thinking about like scalability and of the platform across many of our therapeutic areas as well. So I'd say it's important, um, but um, there's other obviously components to what, what we look for as well. Go ahead, Jessica. Yeah, no, I was going to say just in terms of, you know, the ex an external party kind of understanding how it may fit within Amgen, it, it certainly helps, right? And um, it shouldn't prevent you from bringing something forward, but you should frame the argument appropriately. Like, hey, we know this isn't, you know, your wheelhouse right now, but this is why we think that this is quite meaningful and, and together it can add value. Makes sense. Um, well, here's, um, uh, here's a question from the audience. Um, and this is directed at you, Jessica and, and Rachna. Um, the question reads, what kinds of partnerships uh, is uh, Amgen BD looking to foster aside from startups with new technology? 
Well, the answer is anything that works. So um, we are, um, I think, uh, you know, Rachel mentioned it as before too, and, and also Casey, just in terms of creating a partnership, whatever maximizes the value of the opportunity, right? So, you know, we're bringing something to the table. The other company is bringing something to the table, be it a small startup, um, an academic center, a large pharma. We have lots of, you know, collaborations with our colleagues at large pharma. So it's really just more about the science and the opportunity and who brings what and how does that maximize it getting out to the right patients? And it could be anything from geographic expertise. You know, do you have a commercial sales force in a certain area that can actually, you know, um, be a springboard for this or scientific? It could be manufacturing. It could be regulatory. So all of those are important. Yeah, I agree. And I think, look, again, with some of the examples that I mentioned earlier, we are open to looking for opportunities that span the spectrum from early research all the way to marketed. And so I think it really comes back to what are the capabilities that we have that a company or a partner can leverage? And, and what are the assets that a company is bringing that may help round out, you know, something that we're already doing, it may complement our early research activities, or maybe we're looking to round out our mid-stage oncology or information um, pipeline with additional phase two assets. And so, um, or coming back to the Tesla example, there was a marketed product that fit really nicely within our inflammation portfolio. So we are open to looking for opportunities across that spectrum. And frankly, you know, historically, Amgen has tended to partner more than acquire. Um, and so we believe in the partnership model. That's been kind of a longstanding um, part of the BD DNA, if you will. Um, and so when we look to partner with different players, we are really looking to see how can we work together and build that long-term relationship to maximize the value of a particular program and ultimately get it to patients. Thank you, uh, Rasha and, and Jessica. I know we're coming up towards the end of our uh, our time here. Uh, a, lo lo a last question for me: what uh, What's the best way for folks to get in touch with uh, with any of you? Um, direct email is fine. We actually also have, uh, and and like I think Janice mentioned, we're actually quite a small group um, across digital ventures, BD, genetics, etc. We all know everybody. Uh, so if you email arbitrarily one of us, it will get to the right place. Um, or we, you know, we have a website and that's probably the most, you know, easy and systematic way of doing it. So it's AmGenBD and you can actually just submit your idea or query into that website. And I would say, because we get this question often, it is not a black hole. You will get a response. Um, we are very good about recognizing that people do want to hear back. So um, don't worry. Somebody is at the other end of that inbox. Well, terrific. Um, well, thank you. I want to, I want to thank all of you. Thank, thank my panelists. And I want to thank Mark and his team at uh, the TDG as well as LA best for um, allowing us the opportunity to speak with uh, uh, the, the crew from Amgen. So thank you all. And uh, oh, back to you. Really yeah. And, and thanks, thanks, Roger, for moderating a, a spectacular panel. And it's great to see, you know, through LA Best and the programs like the announcement of the Amgen Golden Ticket and, of course, the early innovator sponsorship, just to see how our relationships continue to grow and help hopefully make the um, make it more seamless in terms of being able to really <laughs> screen 2,500 opportunities. <laughs> but build the, the relationships in parallel. So thanks again and, um, and enjoy the rest of LA Best. Great, thank you. Bye. Thank you.